let's begin by cultivating our motivation. And we're still here on this planet, in this body again this week. Those of us who are listening didn't die between last week and this week, which is a great fortune because our life is so fragile. And because death is something certain, but we don't know when it's going to come, it's important to be prepared for it. and to know how to die or how to steer our minds so that we die in a way that's beneficial for ourselves and others. And doing that, of course, depends on practicing and habituating our mind with the Dharma while we're alive. And so we want to die with bodhicitta so we want to cultivate bodhicitta as much as we possibly can during our lives. And at the time of death, it would be wonderful if we could stop the craving and grasping that fertilize the karma that throw us into another samsaric rebirth. And to do that, we need to have a realization of emptiness, the lack of inherent existence. And so it's for that reason that we're listening and sharing the Dharma this evening so that we can begin to understand the lack of inherent existence so that we can bring that to mind at the time that we're dying and thus steer our mind into a good rebirth. So when so when we're uh, dying, the mind, uh, the ordinary mind, can get quite afraid and crave to keep this body and this life, this identity. You know, everything that we've uh, spent our life cultivating and what we don't want to be separated from because it's what's important to us and makes us feel like we exist. And yet at the time of death, uh, we have to separate. There's no choice. So we crave not to. And at a certain point, we realize we have to, so then we grasp for something else to hold on to. Okay, and so then we grasp for, you know, some identity, this real me that's there. We want another body to prove to ourselves that we exist. Okay, and so that craving and grasping uh, act as the fertilizer that nourish karma, okay, karma that we've created um, previously in this life or previous lives. It will nourish, fertilize certain karma, which will then start to ripen. That becomes the link of becoming. We went over this when we studied the 12 links, remember? And so <coughs> that becoming is that karmic seed when it's just about ready to you know, uh, bring forth the new rebirth. And then when it does, pow, there we go, 
into birth and then following birth immediately starts aging and death. Okay, so it's not like we're born and then everything's nice for a while and then 80 years old, later we get old and die. But from the moment after conception starts the aging and death. True, isn't it? Yeah. And then, you know, between birth and, and when death comes, then we are constantly ch struggling to be happy. So we run around looking for all these things that we think are going to make us happy, all these external things, clutch at them, grab them into us, and then everything that makes us unhappy, that we don't like, that's interfering with our happiness, we push it away, we beat it up, or we run away from it. Okay, And so we're constantly involved in this thing of, you know, wanting things and not getting what we wanted, or getting what we wanted, but it's not as good as we thought it was going to be. And then all the things we don't want, they come even without us asking. And, you know, so this constant struggle, you know, to protect the I, the self, me, to make it happy, you know, protect it from what seems to be threatening it. And so with that kind of motion, motivation, then we're just acting all the time, you know? Mental actions, verbal actions, physical actions, and uh, therefore creating more karma that will throw us into more rebirths. Okay? So the whole thing that where all this uh, can be traced back to is ignorance, the ignorance that misconceives the self, that thinks there's this real solid me there that's alive, and this real solid me there that's dying, and this real solid me there that needs something else to grasp onto so it can prove that it exists. Because even though it feels very solid, it's on shaky ground. So it's always trying to, you know, get some reinforcement so it can feel like it exists. Yeah. But when we uh, ask ourselves, well, what or who is that self that seems to, you know, be so vivid and so clinging and so needy and so frustrated and irritated and angry and belligerent? And who is that I that lives and who is that I that dies? No? Because it feels so solid when we're alive, it feels so solid when we're, in, we're dying we start to question and find and dig around and see what that I is, um, it becomes very difficult to find. It seems so real. But when you try and find it, it's like, you know, um, it's like, you, you know, we've all seen holograms. Yeah? You know, holograms. So it's like, it looks so real, but you go to touch the hologram, you know, there's a person that you're seeing, but you can't actually touch it. Yeah? I think the first hologram I saw was in, when I was a little kid in Disneyland, and you come out of the haunted house. This was I don't know how many years ago. And you're coming out of the haunted house, and you look in the mirror, and there's a ghost sitting next to you. Yeah, remember that? Yeah. And you turn to shake hands, and uh, or scream, depending on what you want to do. And uh, you, you can't touch it, you know. It, it appears, but you can't actually figure out what it is. Yeah. Or, or like a TV set. I think that TV sets are really good examples, I think. Because, you know, when you look at a TV or you go to the movies, you know, all the people on the screen, they look so real, don't they? 
you know? I mean, that's why we go there, because we, we look at all these people and, you know, we generate all these emotions and, and, yeah, I mean, that's why we go, isn't it? You know, so we can have this kind of emotional festival while sitting in our little chair, you know? And, oh, you feel lust and you feel hatred. And, you feel pity and you feel joy and you feel all these things, you know, for $9.99. So it's probably gone up now. But, uh, you know, and so you just feel an emotional festival because it appears like real people. I mean, if we didn't hold it somehow as real people, we wouldn't be having all those emotions, would we? Yeah. So somehow one part of our mind is you know, really taking it like there's these real people, you know, in this box. Well, now it's in a flat box, okay? Yeah, so this flat box in your living room, there's people in it, yeah? And I watch them and I feel all these emotions. Or I look at a screen and there's real people up there, and oh, yeah? But then you go and, and you decide that you want to talk to one of those people that's real, yeah. So you start talking and they ignore you. Can you imagine how rude? You know? Those people have been in your living room the whole hour and then you go to talk to them at the end of the hour and they don't talk back. Yeah. And at that point we go, oh, it's a TV. There's no real people there. But it sure looks like real people. Okay? So there's. There's a deceptive appearance that we take as real. And because we take it as real, we get so emotional. So emotional. Are there any people in, in that screen, in that box? Nothing. Zero. Is there? Nothing. So we've been deceived, haven't we? We pay nine ninety nine and not even real people in there. <laughs> yeah. We were deceived. But look what happens, you know, when we believe our deception deception we got so worked up about it. Okay? So it's similar in our regular life, you know, things appear so solid and so real. We never question them, but if we started to poke around and look for all these real things that appear so vividly to us to exist out there from their own side, then, you know, we would find it difficult to find them. Okay. So tonight we're going to start, you know, looking a little bit more at that. Hopefully we'll get to that part. Uh, I won't get hung up on an early part, and we'll, we'll start the investigation looking for the real thing. Okay, so, Sherlock, get ready. <laughs> okay, so last time we were talking a little bit about what isn't the negated, ob the object of negation, remember? So we were saying that, um, that it's not uh, the object that we're trying to negate in the emptiness meditation, the false I that we think e exists, or the false whatever that we think exists. Isn't the object of an acquired uh, view of the um, perishing aggregates? Okay, Because the objects of the acquired view are things that are made up by wrong philosophies and psychologies. And just negating those alone won't remove the innate ignorance. So we want to look for the object of the innate ignorance. We also talked about how it isn't just the, uh, the conceptual image, the, um, yeah, the objects of the conceptual images that we're negating. Okay, Because some people th say, think, that you know, all, since all concepts are false in the sense, or they're mistaken in the sense that they confuse the image, you know, the meaning generality that's appearing to the mind with the actual object, 
So let's say, well, all of those things, you know, are hindrances to the path. So we just need to, you know, stop having conceptual consciousnesses. And then that's the realization of emptiness. And so then they just try to make, free the mind from all concepts whatsoever and make the mind kind of a blank. But that doesn't really work <coughs> because, well, for two reasons. One is the basic ignorance has, is totally untouched. Yeah, so you haven't even started to refute the, uh, the object of negation. And um, the other reason is that all those objects of the conceptual consciousnesses, you know, they're, or, or put it this way, the, all those conceptual consciousnesses, they're not the root of samsara. Okay? So like the mind that's thinking about the floor plan for the monastic residence, you know, that mind is not the root of samsara. Yeah? It has a, a conceptual image of the floor plan of the monastic residence, but, you know, that's not the root of samsara. So we have to, it's a particular kind of conceptual consciousness, a particular kind of grasping. It's the grasping at true existence, or it's the conception of true existence. Okay, so that's the one that keeps us involved in samsara. And it's that object that we want to prove to ourselves never has existed. With me? Yeah? Okay. And then we also talked last time about how the um, object of negation isn't what appears to our senses either. Okay? Because our, our senses, well, although true existence appears to our senses, our senses don't grasp at true existence. Okay? So, you know, one of the, the big problems, if, if you fall into this thing of thinking that all conceptions whatsoever are bad and negative and we got to get rid of them ASAP and just not have any conceptual consciousnesses, the danger in that is that then you don't uh, uh, apply the method aspect of the path. Okay? So, you know, keeping ethical conduct, being generous, practicing patience, all those kinds of bodhisattva <coughs> activities that we need in, to engage in in order to accumulate merit, <coughs> those can, you know, involve conceptual consciousnesses. And so, if we just say, well, all the conceptual consciousnesses are bad, so we just got to get rid of all of them, then there's the big danger that we just, you know, negate, we, we just don't engage in generosity, ethical conduct, patience. There's also a big danger that then we don't even read the scriptures or study the scriptures because reading and studying involves conceptual consciousnesses. Yeah? So you see there's a big difficulty there. And also another problem of doing that is, um, you know, you'll remember that, well, that when we were talking about how to get to the direct realization of emptiness, we started out with the, the um, distorted view, and then we went to doubt, and then correct assumption, and then inference, and finally getting to the yogic direct perception. Okay, well, that's the way we, we have to go through that process. You don't go from distorted view to direct perception. You know, because otherwise, what are you going to do? Sit there and say empty, 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 and you have no idea what it means. Okay, so you know this process of of gaining the correct the doubt, the correct doubt, then the correct assumption, then the inference. All that depends on studying emptiness, thinking about emptiness, getting an idea of what emptiness is. You know, and then we have to. Uh, gener you know, we have to gain the mind of a special insight, vipassana, and we f when we first gain that mind, it's on um, the conceptual image of emptiness. Yeah, you don't start out your first moment of vipassana with direct perception of emptiness. It has to be on, on the correct inference, so you're still perceiving emptiness through the veil of concept. 
Yeah, but then as you practice more and more, you tear that away until you, you get to the direct perception. Okay, but if you negate all concepts whatsoever, then how are you going to go through that process so that you get to a direct realization? Hmm? You see? Okay. So, that's what isn't emptiness, you know. As I've been saying, I've been talking all week about what things aren't. <laughs> okay, now let's talk a little bit about um, what is the, the object of negation. Okay, now, before we get, there's different levels of the object of negation. And when we start out, we start out with the object of negation of an acquired view of the uh, perishing aggregates, okay? And then we go to deeper and deeper levels, okay? It's like peeling off layers of an onion, you know, trying to, to find a core. There's, there's various gross misconceptions, and then it gets deeper and deeper, okay? So let's just think about the self of persons, okay? Not the self of all phenomena right now, but, but the self of persons, and, and let's look at it. So the, the, the grossest object that, that needs to be negated yeah, is thinking that there is a, a permanent, monolithic, autonomous me, okay, or self. So it's, and so this is a soul, yeah, a soul or a self with a capital S or whatever you want to call it, okay? It's, it's, an, it's the object of an acquired ignorance because it's something that our minds completely created, you know, based on wrong philosophy and psychology. Yeah, there's no innate grasping at this kind of self because this kind of self, it's something that's permanent, so it doesn't change, okay? Totally doesn't change at all. Yeah, no matter what's going on in your life, this self doesn't budge. Yeah, it's monolithic in that it's unitary, it's without parts. Yeah, it's just boing, this one thing. Yeah, and it's uh, autonomous, it doesn't depend on causes and conditions. Yeah. Now, can there be a person that doesn't depend on causes and conditions? Put it this way, if there were a person that didn't depend on causes and conditions, then that would mean that all these things would happen and we wouldn't change. Okay? You could stub your toe, but you wouldn't feel any pain because you have to change in order to feel pain, don't you? This, this self would never grow old because it's unchanging. It doesn't depend on causes and conditions. It's something totally separate from the body, totally separate, and that can be perceived totally independent of the body. Yeah. So you know in that movie, what was it called? I don't watch very many movies. The one, some, some guy, there was a dog in it. <laughs> yeah, I know that you're going to instantly remember that. Yeah, and, and yeah, the zeroes it down, doesn't it? <laughs> but but there was something, you know, and the guy died, and they showed like this thing kind of coming out of him, and going. What? What did you say? Call it? Ghost. Ghost? Was it ghost? No. And it, it came over, and then it went into the dog's body. Body snatchers. I don't think I. Body no, I didn't watch anything called the body snatcher. No, 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 no. <laughs> anyway, it was something, you know, in the movies where they. It was like this whole idea of a self, you know. There's this thing inside of you that's totally independent of the body and mind that just kind of floated up outside you. It was outside you when you die, and it goes. Plunk, you know, into something else, and when it plunks into something else, then it becomes alive. Okay? Yeah, so something totally, you know, independent of our body and mind. 
Yeah, it's like it's the idea of a soul, isn't it? Yeah, <coughs> or in, in you know in Indian religions they would call it an Atman. Yeah, so so that's the grossest one. Yeah, that we start to uh, negate and ask ourselves, you know, can this thing possibly exist? Yeah. Is it very comforting to think that there's something that's always me, that's permanent, that's independent, that's monolithic, that's really me, that, you know, when I die, you know, it's just going to float up out of me and go and, you know, ab absorb into the cosmic consciousness or God's going to take me to the, you know, pearly gates or, or something like that. It's very comforting very comforting emotionally, yeah? But can such a thing exist? You know, forget the emotional comfort. Can it exist? Yeah. Is it possible for such a thing to exist? Well, like I said, you know, then it would be completely independent. Everything you experienced in your life, everything you did, would not affect your soul at all. So you actually couldn't create the causes for heaven and hell. Because if you create the causes and it affects your soul, then your soul's not permanent. And it's not independent from causes and conditions. Okay? So there's some logical difficulties in asserting that kind of soul. So spend some time thinking about this, because a lot of us grew up with this notion, and it's kind of in there somewhere. Yeah, like, oh, I'll die and I'll get scared, but it's okay because there's a real me, you know? And it's unchanging. That's going to get scooped up and taken somewhere. And so sometimes we even bring that idea into Buddhism. You know, we study about Amitabha's Pure Land. Yeah? And we study about the Poa practice. And... You know, Amitabha coming and taking your consciousness to the pure land. And, and even though we say, oh, they're just, you know, it's just the consciousness, our, in our mind, our conception, what we're holding on to, is like a soul. You know? Amitabha is going to come take my soul. <laughs> yeah? We could build a whole... Uh, well, yeah, gospel. Gospel. gospel uh, yeah. I'm not so good at music, but, you know... We could, we could do that. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah take me home to Sukhavati. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this real soul. But, you know, this is the whole thing. Can such a thing possibly exist? Yeah. Okay, so that's the first level of the uh, object of negation. Then the second level of the object of negation is called a self-sufficient, substantially existent person, okay? Or self-supporting, substantially existent. In my notes, it's called SSSE. <laughs> yeah? Because <laughs> it's too long to keep writing out, self-sufficient, substantially existent person. So if I just abbreviate it to self-sufficient person or substantially existent person, just know what I mean, okay? Now, in talking about this, there's, there's of, of that level, that object of negation, there's, there's uh, two parts to it, okay? There's an acquired part and there's an innate part, okay? So the acquired view of a self-sufficient, substantially existent person holds that the person and the aggregates are different, okay? The aggregates of the body and mind. So the person and the aggregates are different. And the analogy is like uh, a shepherd and its sheep. Okay. Actually, let me back up for a minute because there was a, an analogy I forgot to tell you about the, the soul, the, the permanent monolithic one. Okay, let's okay, rewind for a minute. So the permanent uh, monolithic one, the analogy was like... Um, like a coolie and his load, okay? Somebody who's carrying a burden and the burden, the porter, the por porter, yeah? Okay, yeah, in India you call it coolie. Okay, so the porter and then the baggage. 
So there's this idea of the soul that's like the porter, yeah, that picks up this baggage, the body and mind, the aggregates, and you know, carries it around on its back. And then death is it just puts down the baggage and then, you know, goes on and picks up some more baggage. Okay, so that, that's that analogy. Okay, now let's go back to self-sufficient, substantially existent person. The analogy there is like <clears throat> a sheep and a she uh, yeah, a shepherd and the sheep. <laughs> okay, forgot who was uh, herding who here. Okay, so here the self is like the shepherd and the sheep are the mental and physical aggregates. Yeah. So the self is kind of, you know, hurting them along. Yeah, they're different entities, and the self is kind of hurting it along. Um, you know, it's still an acquired view, but it's not quite as gross as the previous one, because it's not saying the person is permanent and monolithic and independent of causes and conditions. But it's, you know, kind of going it towards that direction. To, to the extent that at one point um, Jay Rinpoche actually asks, you know, what's the difference between this one and the one of the, the non-Buddhists? Okay. But anyway, that's, that's the analogy in, in that one. So the, so the self and the person are, are different, yeah? But the self kind of hurting the aggregates. Then the innate um, uh, grasping at self-sufficient, substantially existent person, is the, the self and the aggregates are seen as having the same nature. And so here, the example is like uh, a group of scouts and the head scout, or a group of salespeople and the head salesperson. So, you know, in this one, yeah, because the, the aggregates and the person aren't seen to be two, two different entities, it's kind of like, you know, there's something in the aggregates that actually is the person. And so they usually point to the mental consciousness. So the mental consciousness is part of the aggregates in the same way that the scout leader is a scout. Yeah, but the mental consciousness holds a special role because it's the person that kind of, you know, instructs the, the um, rest of the aggregates what to do in the same way that the head scout instructs all the other boy scouts about what to do, or girl scouts what to do, okay? Yeah, so, so here, this, this is the self that is very much experienced as uh, the controller, the one that controls the aggregates, you know? And, and it's an interesting kind of feeling because we do feel like we can control our aggregates, don't we? You know, because you, know, you hear people say, I can stop smoking any time I want. Right. Yeah. I can stop overeating and lose weight any time I want. Okay, so that, that's that, an example of that self, you know. It, it feels like it's just the mental consciousness, yeah, that is willpower. And if you just, you know, you have that mental consciousness of willpower, and then it's just going to, you know, make you stop smoking, make you, you know, the body stop overeating and, or over drinking or whatever it is. Yeah. So they're very much this idea of a controller. Well, we can we know what's wrong with that one, don't we? <laughs> yeah, us control freaks. <laughs> yeah. We can't control a whole lot, can we? Yeah, especially our own body and mind. You sit down to meditate, the mind's out of control, body's out of control. Can't prevent it from aging and dying. Can't make it, you know, get to the top of the hill when you're tired. Can't make it stay awake when you're meditating. <laughs> yeah, can't make the mind concentrate. Okay, so, so that's the innate grasping at uh, 
self-sufficient, substantially existing person. Then the third level, okay, in the self of persons, is um, the inherently existent self, the truly existent self, okay? The Prasangika sees those two terms as synonymous. The other schools don't necessarily see them as synonymous. So this is a self that seems to be able to exist under its own power, that can set itself up, and that's not dependent on other factors. And here, other factors refer specifically to term and concept, okay? Which means the mind that conceives and labels, okay? So the mind that, con that you know, sees the aggregates, conceives that there's a person in there, and labels person. So, you know, when we say it's independent of other factors, this is really the, the meaning of other factors here. Because you can realize that there's, uh, that the self is dependent on causes and conditions, but still have grasping at true existence. Yeah, because you haven't realized the self is also dependent on, you know, term and concept. Okay, so there's a few different ways of describing, uh, other ways of describing how this self appears, okay? So, um, okay, so it appears without, um, as if it's not posited, it's not labeled, it's not designated through the force of a conventional consciousness, okay? So it's independent of term and concept. It seems other power, like I said, other meaning that it's independent of term and concept, conventional thought. Um, Ling Rinpoche described it as the basis of designated designation and the designated object appearing undifferentiable. Okay, your spell check goes crazy when you type und undifferentiable. Okay, but it emphasizes what's happening. The basis of designation, the aggregates, and the self that exists independence upon the aggregates, because it's labeled independence upon the aggregates, they appear completely mixed and undifferentiable. Okay, she so can't separate out What's the basis of designation? You can't separate out what's the self. They're, they're just mixed, okay? An, another way of describing it is that um, something that exists beyond being what is merely labeled by term and concept. So here it's very interesting to just think of term and concept and then something that exists beyond that. Yeah, not just existing independence upon being labeled, but something more than that, something that has some existence from its own side. Um, okay, so it's, it's this feeling of I that's kind of mixed in with the aggregates, but also kind of different from them. So it's, you're not holding the aggregates as one, you know, the self and the I as having the same nature, and you're also not holding them as having totally unrelated natures. It's this fuzzy kind of mind that, you know, there's a self that's somehow related to this body and mind inside of the body, you know, inside of the mind, but also it's a little bit independent of them. Okay, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah, so it's just kind of, every, everything's kind of, it's, it's mush, basically, yeah, that this mind, uh, how it thinks of things, is, is kind of mush. So we're not actually grasping the self and the aggregates as one, and we're also not actually grasping them as completely separate. 
It's just this mush in between. Because they say that we don't inherently, um, we don't innately grasp the self and the aggregates as one because we'll, you know, we'll say things like, my stomach hurts. So if we say, my stomach hurts, the I and the stomach are different. Okay, so the fact that we say things like that just in ordinary language shows that we're not, there's not an innate grasping that the self and the aggregates are one. Okay, because if they were one, we wouldn't say, my stomach hurts. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, we don't have an innate grasping that, that the self and the aggregates are totally different and unrelated. Because, uh, you know, when the mental consciousness is unhappy, we say, I'm unhappy. Or when the mental, when the feeling aggregate of happiness is, you know, we, ha we have that happy feeling, then we say, I'm happy. So there, you know, it's, it's showing that we don't see the self and the aggregates as totally different because then we wouldn't say, I'm happy, as if I and the happiness are completely merged. Okay, It's very interesting to, to spend some time just observing how we use the word I and how we think of the, the relationship between I and the aggregates. You know? And what's the difference in our feeling between you know, I don't feel well and my stomach hurts. Yeah, is there some difference, that, you know, in how you describe it to yourself and why sometimes do we say my stomach hurts and other times we say I don't feel well when our stomach hurts? Why do we do one and, and not the other? Hmm? And who's, who's that I? you know, that doesn't feel well. And who's that I that possesses the body, that seems to possess the body? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, how we think about the self and the aggregates, it's all kind of jumbled up there. You know, and the mind keeps changing about it. Okay. Okay, now, remember some time ago we were talking about the observed object and the apprehended object and the referent object, and you know, you were looking at me like, huh, what are you talking about? So here's where it's useful. Yeah, when, um, okay, on the basis of the aggregates, yeah, we merely label I. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, that I that exists by being merely labeled in dependence on the aggregates, that's the conventional I, that's the mere I, that's the I that exists. It's the one that, that creates karma, that practices the Dharma, that goes on until enlightenment. Okay, but it exists by only by being labeled in dependence upon the aggregates. Yeah. So when we we say I like that, the, you know, the observed object is I, like I'm walking down the street or I'm sitting here trying to understand Dharma class. Um, you know, the observed object is the conventional I, your you know, your um, apprehended object is the conventional I. Yeah. So that must that perception is mistaken because inherent existence is appearing, but you're not grasping at the eye is inherent, inherently existent. Okay. Now, when instead of, of just saying, well, I'm sitting here, you know, listening to Dharma teachings, you go, I can't understand this. I'm so frustrated. What in the world are these emptiness teachings about? I don't understand. Okay. So at that point, something else is going on, right? Yeah, the I has gotten very reified, very solid. Yeah, 
That's the mind that's grasping at the true existence of the I. Yeah, I don't understand. I'm so frustrated. I'm so stupid. Or they're so, you know, incapable of explaining it to me so I understand. Yeah, whatever it is, okay? So, at that time when you're having the grasping at an inherently existent I, your observed object is still the conventional I. Yeah, but your apprehended object is the truly existent I. Because that's what you're apprehending, is this solid, real I. Okay? We also say your referent object, because it's conceptual consciousness, so it has a referent object, that that's also the truly existent person. Okay? So that, that consciousness it's not just mistaken because inherent existence is appearing to it, but it's also erroneous because it's thinking that there's this real, truly existent person there. And there's not. Yeah. So we have this kind of erroneous consciousness so often in the course of the day. Do we recognize it as a, an erroneous consciousness? No, not at all. It seems perfectly normal. Yeah, because we feel like, well, after all, there is a real me in there. Yeah. So, you know, here we are. It's, you know, other examples of erroneous consciousnesses are mistaking a <laughs> scarecrow for a person. That's a pretty gross erroneous consciousness. Okay, or thinking that the image in the in the uh, mirror is a real person. It's a little bit subtler. But then here's this other one that's also totally erroneous because there's no, you know, inherently existent person. But, you know, one is not only appearing, but we are grasping and assenting to that appearance. Okay. So that consciousness is mistaken in reference to the apprehended object and the referent object. Okay? Okay, so you're asking about differentiating virtuous and non-virtuous action. That's kind of another topic. Oh, what's in control of taking decisions? Oh, what's in control of taking? Oh, okay. Well, this is a very interesting, the, what, the one that makes the decision. And the one that discerns this is virtuous and that's not virtuous. Okay. Because it appears to be an I there. Yeah. And an I that's making a decision. I decided to do this. I decided not to do that. Who's that I? Okay. It appears as if there's just something there. Yeah. Again, kind of in control, managing the show, independent, mixed in. Yeah. But if you start to, to ask, you know, why do I say, you know, on what basis do I say that I'm making a decision? Then you start looking at all the different mental factors. So if you've spent some time studying low rig, mind and awareness, and where it talks about the different mental factors, then you start tracing back all the different mental factors that need to be involved with the decision appearing, okay? So there's the, you know, you have the, the five um, mental factors that are there with every cognition. Uh, let's see, you have a feeling, discrimination, intention, attention, and contact, okay? So you have those five. And then some apidharmas say that there's another set that's always there with every virtuous mind. But we won't get into that right now. Anyway, then you have to have some wisdom there, too, yeah, to be able to discriminate. You probably have to have some mindfulness of the object that, that you're uh, focused on. Yeah. You have to have some conscientiousness that values virtue and wants to discern what is virtuous. Okay. So you have to have a lot of different mental factors 
you know, to look at a to look at a situation and discriminate what's virtuous from what's non-virtuous. So it isn't just one mental factor that's making a decision, is it? Yeah. There's there's a whole bunch of different consciousnesses, there's a whole bunch of different mental factors. In dependence upon all of that, we label I and we say, I'm making a decision. Okay? But when you scratch and you dig to how exactly is that decision being made, it's not like there's something out here, you know, that's going, I'm making this decision. Yeah? Because if there were some independent I, yeah, that wasn't influenced by other causes and conditions? How could it change? If there were an inherently existent I, it would have to be permanent, it would have to be independent of causes and conditions. It could never make a decision, because making a decision means changing. Doesn't it? Yeah. So you see, having some some inherently existent I there that's making the decision. It can't be like that. It feels like that. And our language uses makes us think that there's something like that. But when we scratch, there's nothing you can, there's no I there that you can draw a line around and say that's what's making the decision. <coughs> okay? All you have is all these different mental factors. You know, this whole little festival of mental factors, and in dependence upon it, we say, I. Hmm? Similar with make a decision. What in the world is a decision? A decision seems so real, doesn't it? I made a decision. There's an I, and there's a decision. You know, I've decided pancakes for breakfast every day. Okay, no, no. you should. No. I decided we're not going to war. Yeah. Okay. So it appears that there's this big eye and there's this big decision that's getting made. What in the world is a decision? Okay. On what? I ask myself questions like, on what basis do I say that I'm making a decision or that a decision is being made? On what basis? How do I know I'm making a decision? Yeah. How do you know you're making a decision? Well, there's a few different options. Yeah. And you could do any of them. And you're confused for a while about which one of them to do. And at one point, you kind of go, that one. Yeah, or some kind of combination of mental factors happens that where this one appears, you know, to meet your criteria most, depending what your, you know, what's your criteria? The happiness of this life, creating virtue for next life, attaining liberation, attaining enlightenment. What are your criteria for making a decision? So at some point, you know, then there's this, something happens, where you just know going in that direction. But, you know, there's not a thing that, you know, somebody hands you and you're, there's your decision. Is there? You know? It feels like that. And that's how we think of it. There's this real me and there's this real decision. But when you look, you know? So it's, it's very interesting to, to ask ourselves these kind of questions, you know, how do I know I'm blah, 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 you know, or on what basis do I say I'm blah, blah, blah-ing, yeah? yeah. It, it's really interesting, for one, for example, when, I'm getting a little off the topic, but you know me, um, when we say I'm tired, okay, on what basis do we say I'm tired? Because it appears like tired is this solid thing, isn't it? I'm tired. It's like, I gotta go to bed. There's no choice. I'm tired. 
But then ask yourself, on what basis do I say I'm tired? How, how do I know I'm tired? How do you know you're tired? What's happening that you say, I'm tired? Huh? Eyes burn. The eyes burn. The energy is slower. Hard to think. Huh? Hard to think or yeah, the mind's kind of yeah. difficult to concentrate. It's foggy. Yeah. 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 Are any of those things in and of themselves tired? A foggy mind is a foggy mind. Yeah. Burning eyes are burning eyes. Yeah, no energy is no energy. Where's the tiredness? <laughs> she said, it's in there somewhere. <laughs> I feel it. It's there. Where's the bed? <laughs> yeah? But it's interesting, isn't it? You know? Because we feel it so strongly. And yet, when we dissect, you know, what exactly is the feeling of tiredness? Because if it were foggy-mindedness, then it couldn't be burning eyes and it couldn't be no energy. And if it were one of the others, it wouldn't be foggy, foggy. And anyway, what's foggy mindedness? When we say, I have a foggy mind, how do you know you have a foggy mind? What does that mean? What's a foggy mind? On what basis do you say I have a foggy mind? It's not clear, but what does that mean, not clear? What does that mean? My mind's not clear. Yeah, yeah. Some, some kind of fog, yeah. Some kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, real fog. Real fog. <laughs> so what you're doing is every time we come up with a concept to describe something, you look at what you're calling a name, and then you take that apart and say, yeah. well, what is that? And then what is clear? And then what is mine? So you keep taking yeah. it apart smaller and smaller yeah. pieces until there's nothing that can be actually pointed to that says yeah. this is yeah. yeah there's a, on the conventional level, there is an experience that right. this mere eye has. That right. On the conventional level, there's a feeling of, and we say, I'm tired. Yeah. But when we actually ask, what does tired mean? Mm -hmm. And who's tired? We can't really find anything there. Mm -hmm. Okay? So when we can't find anything there, it light, lightens the situation up a little bit. Yeah? Is it the <laughs> conventional <laughs> self that's apprehending the inherently who's existent who's self? Doing the who's doing the? Well, we say, yeah, I'm. We say I'm grasping an inherent existence. And yeah. our, the the, who's doing the well, the only self that exists is the conventional one. So that's the only one that could be doing. That. Yeah. Whenever we say I'm apprehending this or that. It's always the conventional one, because the conventional self is the only one that exists. The mere I is the only I that exists. There's no other I. But it still sees things mistakenly. But it still can see things mistakenly. Yeah. The, the, the conventional I has the, the mental factor of view of the perishing aggregates. Yeah? Huh? Yeah, the, existence yeah. Existence. the conventional eye has the, the grasping. Yeah, because you can't have an inherently existent eye that's grasping because there's no such thing as an inherently existent eye. Yeah? This is very strange when you think about it. Yeah? Very strange. You know, this conventional eye that I have no clue what it is, you know, 
that exists be merely by being labeled. And every time I look for what it is, I can't find it. But it does all these things. Yeah. How is that possible? How is it possible that something I can't find is doing all these things? It's invisible. Hmm? It's invisible. It's invisible. It definitely is. But it's strange, isn't it, when you think about it? You know, this thing that I can't find, that I can't pinpoint, the mere eye that exists by being merely labeled in dependence on the aggregates. What in the world is that? You can't find anything there. You can't draw a line. You can't even find it and say what, what it is. And yet, it's the one in samsara. It's the one that feels happy. It's the one that feels miserable. It's the one that gets reborn. It's the one that becomes enlightened. And you can't find it for the life of you. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? Yeah? <laughs> yeah? Because it, it feels like, well, no, there's got to be something there. Because after all, I'm me and I'm not you. And if it were all just all this stuff about concept and labels, then how come we don't get all mixed up because we're all just <laughs> labels, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so there's got to be something in here that's really different, that makes me unique and different from you. <laughs>